Coming up on Pinsky in the Brain, we sit down with AJ Sour Diesel and learn the origin story of the best weed in the world. Pinsky in the Brain, this week's brain needs no introduction. He's my co-conspirator, partner in crime, 30-year friend, even though we've really only been hanging out for the last 10 years. The man himself, A.J. Sour Diesel. Joe Murray, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Tell me, what's your, uh, what's your worst memory of me? It's my worst memory of you? Yeah. Oh my God, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many. Which one? Um, well, there's that one iconic memory of, uh, you know, your, uh, participation in the conspiracy to steal sour clones. Oh, so that, interesting. That's the most iconic one. I think that's the story that like the world actually really wants to know because sour diesel was closely coveted. I mean, like there were literally like two crews, maybe five people that grew sour in the nineties. And then there was kind of like a time right around the turn of the century where the weed got out. What what was your recollection of that? It's a lot it's a lot to unpack, but uh the Where were you? I mean like, you know, where were you living at the time? I was living over on uh Fourth Avenue in uh the south side of Park Slope, Brooklyn. Yeah. And uh there was a lot of uh a lot of things going on in this particular building that I was living in. And, uh, you know, you were in and out of there. So you I was in and out of there, but I was in and out of there in a different context because like when we first met in the nineties, I wasn't like, I don't know. For, well, first of all, I didn't even exactly know, like, you know, the sour for me came from the Albany crew, right? It came from uh, Keith, the bro. Um, and I knew that, you know, there was sour, but it wasn't exactly clear to me that it was coming directly from you for a little bit of time. By the time I realized it and figured it out, I had been getting my weed from the guy that lived above you. And um, but like I would see you in the building, all, you know, quite often. I think that. Um, yeah, I think it's a lot to go into that whole that whole story. We, I remember I getting, think we need an hour just for that. I remember getting a phone call at like two in the morning and I would typically like, you know, go weed shopping at night because getting in and out of the city, I lived in, in, uh, in Soho. Right. So I'd go over the Manhattan bridge and it was easier to go over the Manhattan bridge at like 2 AM than it was like, you know, at any other time. So it wasn't unusual that I would get a call from my friend, Brandon. Right. And Brandon called me up one time and he's like, Pinsk, you got to get over here like right now. And I'm like, what's going on? Like I'm leaving, you know, I was leaving for the, uh, Fish was playing uh, the Millennium shows at Big Cypress. And I was literally leaving the next morning. And uh, yet, when you get the call, and, and when you get the call and it's the type of call that people are, can't even tell you over the phone, because, you know, we couldn't talk over the phone. It was just like, you have to come over right now. So I got in my car and went to Brandon's house and he handed me like uh, four clones. And he didn't even, even in person, he didn't tell me what they were or how he got them. He just says, you know what these are, right? And I looked at him and I said, yes. And that's it. I took them and I didn't have a grow. I actually got them to my friend, uh, Chris Bud. And Chris Bud had a couple of lights on. And I think that was like one of the origin stories of how Sour escaped the clutches. It is. Um, there's a few ways that it got out, but that was that was the New York leak. Absolutely. And it basically involved a robbery on my house. And uh, yeah, which was completely unbeknownst to me, you know, that someone had broken in and taken clones. Well, uh, I mean, wasn't it? Take a few snips. I mean, wasn't it someone that was kind of close to you that it was? But they see that's where that's where I that's why I'm saying that this is a this is a big story to unpack because there's a lot of background just in all the culprits involved in this situation. Care to name any names? Sure. I mean, there was Brandon, there was Samantha. I remember when you and I kind of reacquainted and, uh, and there was a while when like, you know, I was seeing gravy and getting sour from him and I knew, and I knew he was getting it from you. I knew he was in touch with you. And for a long time, word was on the street that, uh, that I was the one, even though I wound up with the cuts, 
that I was the one that uh, that went into your place. As a matter of fact, in 2014, I went out to go see Adam Dunn in Colorado. I was like, yo, man, you got to talk to AJ and like, you know, settle the score. He said that he talked to you and you were like, oh, yeah, Pinsky, I remember that guy. Uh, he's the guy that like stole the cuts, you know, like uh, he was, I said he was an accessory. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, no, I always knew exactly what happened because uh, not, you know, it only maybe four or five weeks went by after this happened. And, um, that's all, you know, Samantha want, was trying to extort Brandon for money or drugs or something. And, and he was getting fed up with it. And so she wanted to punish him. So she called me to tell me, hey, I broke into your apartment. I stole oh. these clones and Brandon's involved. So in when it. did I get roped into it? Um, well, then I so I, I went and confronted Brandon and he threw you under the bus immediately <laughs> and said, I gave him to Pinsky. <laughs> So Pinsky wanted me to do it. So, um, so yeah, so he immediately blamed you. Okay. And, uh, you know, but you can't really blame him. I mean, he was pleading with me not to beat him up. So, um, that's one of the long lost stories of like people that like, you know, like, you know, their whole life changed after things went sour, right. With, with, uh, with you. Yeah. Well, it was the end of my relationship with that guy for sure. Would you ever consider, um, uh, accepting his apology? I wouldn't consider having anything to do with him. I'll accept an apology from anyone. <laughs> I haven't seen you write someone off and then kind of open the doors back. I'm more forgiving than I used to be, but you know, but for that particular circumstance, I don't think that there was anything to reconcile. I mean, you know, um, that's garbage human behavior. So it's so it was so deplorable the whole circumstance that it, there was there was no coming back from that. Well, if you think about it, I mean, like you know what you guys you know had was like closely guarded, right? Highly coveted, right? Um, and then all of a sudden, like you know, when 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 cuts get out, like you know, sour all of a sudden started to to you really know, become wide more widely available. It it did, but it didn't. Re it never affected or hurt me in any way really it was more just uh just insulting that someone had broken into my apartment what about uh, stolen property you know i didn't kick down your door man you know no, i was, no, I was no. an accessory no you were just the fence yeah yeah i didn't even get any of it actually you know what i wound up just having it for like an hour and giving it to to, to chris bud and i think he gave it to crispy and that you know sent it out to the to the west coast um but um I think I wound up getting like, you know, uh, an ounce or two. As a matter of fact, Crispy uh, had it with his with one of his friends who gave me two ounces and that got me into a, a big feud with him. Right. Because I was like talking to his friend. It was always like this code about like who you could talk to. And this guy is my connect and you can't have his number, you know, like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and it, it was almost like you had to mark your territory by bringing that person around too, and making sure that everybody knew this is this this is mine. This because otherwise, is mine. you might say, "Oh, dude, I was out at a show last night, and I met this guy Phil, and uh, you know, I got his number, and you know, now we're talking." That now, you had to bring <laughs> Phil out once or twice, and claim and claim, and point your finger at him, and be like, "That's mine." Yeah, yeah. Jason Pinsky belongs to me, Brandon used to say. Yeah, really? Probably, yeah. I never had to say it to me, but yeah. People tried to keep us away from each other, man. I think intentionally for that reason. Well, I was trying to keep away from everybody anyway. You know, I really didn't want to, uh, I really didn't want to be anywhere affiliating with, after a certain point. You know, in the beginning, I wanted to know everybody. I wanted to be in the center of everything, you know, when I first started out selling weed as a youngster, right? But by the time I was in my mid to late 20s, I realized that's not a good thing. Yeah. You don't want to be the guy that everybody knows, that everybody talks about. You want to be like the guy in the shadows that nobody knows. You want to put those guys on as buffers in front of you. I spent a long time um, also like, you know, having a professional career, right, in music and, and tech and, uh, and then having weed, right, as like, you know, like my, and to people that knew me, you know, they always knew that they could get weed for me and that I always had my own stuff going on. 
And I guess that was somewhat known in New York when I got out to Colorado uh, in 2014. And uh, it was the, I went right to Hood Lab, uh, right to Adam Dunn's couch. That's yes, the first place you always go. That's the first place yeah, you always right. go. Yeah. And, uh, and Is that I came when he in, had the big store with the hangout room in the he back. He had the uh, the hood lab, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, with the hangout room in the back and the whole thing. And um, when I came into Colorado, Colorado in 2014, and I was like, you know, I rented a Harley and you know came in all rough and you know had good weed and everyone's like, damn, like who is this guy? And my whole thing was, I was like, dude, the the reason you have no idea who I am is is by design. You know, it's intentional. Back in the day, not being known was a good thing. And it might still be. People knew Sour Diesel, but it wasn't really like, when did it really start to differentiate to become like, you know, age, the AJ cut? I mean, if you think about it, you know, often, uh, what's the expression? I, I don't even know how that happened, really, because, you know, I didn't, it certainly wasn't something that I set out to do. One day I realized that my name was attached to all these things that were being bought and sold and it had nothing to do with me. There was a lot of sour diesel, though, that wasn't that was called sour diesel. You know what I mean? Like uh, like what happened in in uh, in Amsterdam, right? There was the, the New York sour diesel. What's the difference? Oh, it was the New York City diesel. The NYC diesel. Yeah. What's the what's the difference? No relation. You know, that's just that was just, you know, someone doing marketing to you know, promote what they were promoting in Amsterdam. That had nothing to do with us. Often imitated, never duplicated. Yeah, you know, that, that was that was just clever marketing. That was like fake Gucci bags. I think for me, sidewalk. when we got back in touch, um, I remember the story, I think it was like, you know, so this is the thing, music was one of the things, like even if you claimed a certain person, you know, when you see people out at shows, it's kind of like it was it was to some degree a little bit open territory, but once the industry started to happen in 2014, 15, and like, you know, corporate, like big weed started. Yeah, I don't know what it was like for other people, but for me, it was really, I mean, it, yeah, there was a code, but a lot of people, most people didn't honor that code. Most people were, were cutthroat. Most people were, uh, uh, looking to connect with anyone and everyone, especially, you know, like the, the, their, uh, uh, associates, resources, and customers, and clients, and, and so for me, it was really just leverage, you know, because nobody wanted to piss me off. Because if they did, then I wasn't going to talk to them anymore, and that was going to, you know, prevent them from getting their weed. My experience in that world is completely different because I had enormous leverage over a, a lot of people because they wanted to stay on my good side. How much weed was there? I mean, like, you know, I got to assume you know, part of your, and what was like the decision matrix for you in terms of, okay, I'm growing a certain amount of weed. It's going to come out every three months and, uh, and who gets it? Like what was, what tipped the scale at the height of things? It was like literally only, you know, maybe, uh, uh, 15 or 20 pounds every, Each. every two and a half, three months, 20 pounds at all. That's it. You know, I mean, it was, it was all small batch. I was so, lucky you know, to get a like people, a quarter pound or half a pound of it, you know, and then I would you have were. to. Yeah. You yeah. were. I know. It I wasn't know. cheap. I always used to tell people the hookup isn't the price. It's the fact that you're getting it at all. Yeah. I guess that's kind of like any, like, you know, supply and demand, right? Like limiting supply. But it wasn't like you were limiting supply from an economic perspective. It was just because, like, you know, growing 20 pounds is like what? Like a, one room in a house upstate or like what was the deal? Yeah, it was. A, we had a warehouse in, in, in the city and it was we could get, you know, yeah, maybe 20 pounds out of out of the two rooms we were yeah. operating. What did a, what did a pound of weed cost back in the day? Like, you know, like average and then and then it top, really top depended. Line. I mean, if you if you were my best, best friend. Yeah. You know, eight thousand. Eight thousand. If you did something, you know, if, if, if you were just like a regular like uh, uh, Custy, then, you know, you, I might charge eighty eight hundred. You know, five fifty an ounce. If was there were, if, was there bidding wars ever? I mean, like if people try to pay well, more. Sometimes people would piss me off, and in order to get back in good grace, it was ninety six. <laughs> and you know, I mean, the, the, the records were set. I mean, I, I you know, I, it went as high as fifteen, but uh, fifteen thousand. Yeah, 
Someone paid fifteen thousand for a pound of sour diesel. I sold three pounds for forty five thousand dollars. Is that the record? I mean, like you know, does weed get sold? That record's for- been beaten now. I think like you know, you got the grandma's cookies crew now in New York. And- yeah. You know, uh, people are brokering their stuff for, you know, $8,000 a quarter pound. So, I mean, I feel like I, I might have, you know, set the stage and then dipped out. But, like, I, I might have had a small hand in, in helping that happen in creating this why, outrageously why, expensive uh, uh, high-end market. Why did you dip out? I mean, like, you know, I think it was 2014, 15 that you left New York. Like, what were you thinking? Yeah, but I, I dipped out before that. I mean, I dipped out before I left New York. In, in 2011, I got married. Yeah. And, you know, and, and my, my ex-wife really wanted me to stop doing all these things and to start behaving like a, a normal responsible adult and uh and so you know i tried doing other things and and uh uh i tried stepping away from that i mean i still consulted for people and helped them with grows but in 2011 i it was the first time i think since 1994 that i didn't have a grow going anywhere yeah and i kind of laid low for a few years until um yeah until a guy from Colorado came in knocking and found me in New York and asked me to go run his grow in Denver. What's that experience been like, you know, like uh, having your own uh, destiny, right? Like running your own uh, underground kind of situation and the money you would make and the lifestyle that you would lead versus like trying to enter the legal market. And, you know, you went from Colorado to California. Um, You know, how have things changed? Things have changed in that back in the day, you really had to find people that you could trust to work with. I mean, the most important consideration is, will this guy rat on me? Right. If this guy gets in trouble, is he going to tell on me? Right. You know, I need a guy who, you know, is going to fall on the sword here. So that was the priority. You know, nowadays, you know, when you're running a, a commercial license grow, you can actually hire talent. You can actually hire people with uh, experience that know what they're doing. Yeah. So in a way that, that's changed a lot. Um, There's more. You also get to go home and relax and, you know, all the pressure is not on you. It's, it's, it's on somebody else. There's more of a workforce out there that's available. You think that impacts the quality of the weed? Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, there's nothing like doing something yourself and, you know, doing it all yourself. Yeah. Being the the weakest link in your own chain. Yeah. What was the scariest thing that ever happened to you back back in the day? Like, uh, did you ever get arrested or popped or close? Probably the closest. The closest I came to getting arrested was in 2002. Yeah. And uh, I was transporting uh, some baby plants. I think we had about 150 or 200 in the back of a pickup truck. And uh, we had a little canvas cover covering the... uh, the back of the truck and that was it and we just threw the plants in there because we were just taking them across town to drop them off at another spot and uh and we're driving right <clears throat> through williamsburg right under the williamsburg bridge yeah we're about a block from the mother grow and we stopped at a stop sign and then started moving and a police car blew through a stop sign no lights on no uh no siren and just plowed right into the front end of the truck hit you guys hit us hard (laughs) broke the front axle of 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 the truck and it was a big truck it was a big pickup truck so um so we said shit you know so we get we now we have to get out of the truck and talk to these guys and within a matter of moments there's two more police cars and four more cops. And and now we're standing on the side of the road, you know, talking, giving a statement, what just happened. The six cops asking us questions. Have you been drinking? Have you been using any drugs? You guys completely sober, you know, and, and, oh yes, we are. Um, Meanwhile, we're right below the footpath of the Williamsburg bridge where Mm -hmm. this has taken place. And, and some spectators who were crossing the bridge witnessed the accident. And they're screaming down from the top of the bridge, nice going, you stupid fucking pigs. You know, like just insulting the police 
And, you know, and I'm pretending that I don't hear it while I'm having a conversation with them, you know, just trying to keep a straight face. And, um, and yeah. And so we got through that. We were, you know, I could smell the plants. I don't know if they could smell the plants, you know. We were, were they just under a tarp? Yeah, just under a tarp. We weren't injured. So, um, so you know, I said, are, are we free to go now? After they took our statement and they said, yeah, you know, you're free to go. Do you need a tow truck? So we, we, we tried starting the car and it kind of like the axle was clearly bent or broken. I mean, the front, the car was moving up and down um, as we, but I was like, oh yeah, it works. You know, like, so get us where we're going, you know? And we literally slowly just like, like pulled away, bouncing up and down <laughs> from the scene. And uh, yeah, those cops were super lucky that, that we were uh, up to no good because, uh, you know, they would have been in big, in big shit, but we kept saying, oh no, no, we're fine. You know, it's no problem. You know, these things happen, you yeah. know? And, uh, and so that's probably the closest that I came personally to like getting caught you would always hear stories of, uh, you know, something happening at the grow or like at, at like an adjacent apartment and like, you know, something happens. I grew up in a doorman building and I learned from my dad that if you gave the doorman money all the time and the super and everybody else in the building, that everybody would take really good care of you. Yeah. So in any of the buildings where we ever operated, where we had a super or, or you know, uh, uh, we never had a doorman, but where we had like, you know, employees inside the building. They were all in the take. I always took really good care of them. I gave them $500 at Christmas. I gave them, you know, yeah. uh, things, just whatever, anything, anything I could do to help those guys and always keep them really happy. And so that, that saved me from a lot of also dangerous situations with leaks happening. Cause you know, there's been a few of those over the years. Same thing with the tenants in the bill. I mean, I, I once, destroyed an entire my neighbor's in part my neighbor's apartment uh when one of my uh employees left a hose on and went home for the night uh and flooded the entire building and you know i went into this guy's place looked at the damage and basically bought him all new furniture bought him a new laptop like you know the, these are the kind of damage control situations that you know as long as you stayed on top of you could you could uh uh avoid uh, yeah. trouble so yeah. Um, so a lot of times things like that happened. Um, that's probably about as close as to getting. What's like there. the typical AJ morning routine? Like, bring me through it. The morning routine is me rolling out of bed, putting putting on my skids, making some coffee, reading the newspaper. Um, you know, real easy uh, mornings. I like it nice and simple. I don't like getting up and rushing anywhere. Um, I like to wake up and sort of take my time adjusting. Like for this morning, you got me up way too early. <laughs> like this should be happening at midnight, not, not at noon. Yeah, true. I'm an evening person, you know, mornings are rough for me. Yeah. Like, you know, there's like, you know, a whole New York scene that's happening. Like me and you are out here in California right now and New York is popping off and everyone keeps saying to me and I'm sure to you like man where is the where is that sour you know from back in the day like it seems almost like the the purple weed has taken over like what are your thoughts on uh, on some of the original you know genetics coming back well look when i first moved out west you know gorilla glue had taken over so there's always going to be some kind of pop you know, uh, trend that people are, uh, you know, participating in, right? But then there's always going to be OJ, OG, Cam, Sour. These things are haze. They're not haze. Yeah, it's it's not going away. So, um, so yeah, I don't really worry too much about what the trends are. Um, and some of this new stuff's great, like that grape gas. You know, I, I purple weed can be fun. Yeah. The staples for me are those original that, that are original from my generation. Like that's the stuff. I don't know if it's nostalgia or if I just have better taste than, you know, the, the millennials. But I think that the, those things are I think they have longevity and I think that they, they have permanence in the market, whereas all this other stuff doesn't. So uh, we started with what's your worst memory of me? What's your what's your best memory? 
My best memory of you is either getting kicked out of the Airbnb in Amsterdam or, uh, you know, Neil Diamond. That was a good one. Take us through the Amsterdam story. Well, we went out for the 2014 Cannabis Cup uh, to Amsterdam, and you rented this fancy, fancy Airbnb that was way too nice for us. And uh, it was you, me, and Brendan Dabbs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, it, was anyone else staying there? It was just the three nope, of us? No, it was just the three of us, yeah. But there was like 30 people in Brendan there. Brendan Dabbs, for uh, for reference, like he had just won. He kept he basically kept winning Cannabis Cups for uh, Dabalicious. Yeah, was, or that uh, was right before he went on. Actually, spot, right? was, he was judging with us at yeah, that yeah, time. Yeah, so yeah, we were all yeah. judging concentrates. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're all judging concentrates. We got a big, long table, and everyone's got, you know, 70 concentrates laid out in front of them. Set the stage, right? Because, like, back in the day, you would judge a high times cup, and you would have dabs, and you would basically get... I think they gave us over 100 grams on that one. Well, it was was like 60 entries, and they were 2 grams a piece back in the day. These days, like, they give you, like, a... A half a gram. A point three or something, yeah, 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 yeah. ridiculous. No, they're, they're... there was an, an ample amount yeah. of, of BHO in the in those kits. I think it was around 1 a.m. one night we decided to go out for pancakes, right? Yeah. It was you, me, and Brendan. We're walking to the, the pancake house. There's a 24-7 pancake house somewhere in Amsterdam. But there was also someone else in the in the cast of characters, well, right? Well, that, that's how it all began, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got a phone call on the way to the pancake house that... Uh, that there was a man down in front of the building that we were uh, staying at, and that uh, it was our buddy Rick, and he was high out of his mind on acid. Um, he had already been robbed for his cell phone the day before. That's right, he had no phone. Yeah, he almost got Rob Clark killed the night before. So, uh, 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 and they got robbed like in an alley in Amsterdam lost their phones so so i i received this call on a on a on a bypasser's phone that he had just you know <laughs> begged me to use so he says listen you know i said rick meet us over at the pancake house he said listen i'm so high i can't do anything he's like there's a man down on the field right now you need to come get he me. was the man down yeah he said i need to be rescued right now <laughs> like i'm in trouble i'm losing it right so we had a man down so i said you guys go have pancakes i gotta go find rick and so um you know i found rick in front of the building when i got back to the building and we went upstairs and you know i'm sitting there doing dabs rick's kind of buzzing around all over the apartment you know moving around he's in his own world what rick failed to mention is that he had thrown coins at and rang at every buzzer he thought we were home in the building he thought we were looking home. for us okay <laughs> and it was like 1 a.m you know and and he woke up everybody in the building right the landlord wasn't supposed to be airbnb being the apartment right so she gets a phone call from the tenants who are now furious at her we told you no airbnb you got guests some crazy guy just rang all the buzzers and threw coins at our windows it woke us thought everyone in the building up Rick didn't mention that when we went upstairs, so I had no idea. And, uh, you know, the, the apartment had an elevator that just opened right into the that. apartment. I remember that. I remember that. And I heard the elevator at some point, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, cool, you know, like, that's Pinsky and Brandon coming back from the pancake house. Yeah, yeah. And... It turned out to be the landlord, the, the, the owner of the apartment. She comes storming in. Which one of you is Jason Pinsky? <laughs> she came in looking for Jason Pinsky. And uh, at which point Rick says, I got to go. And he goes back to his hotel room now and leaves me with this woman. She throws me out, basically. She tells me to get all my shit. She sees all the dabs on the table. There's about, uh, you know, 200. Least, there's about 200 samples in little <laughs> one gram packets all over. The, it looks like we were like, like running a drug organization. And she kicks me out. So I'm on the phone to you saying, dude, you better get back here right now, dude, and deal with this lady. She's calling the cops. I'm like sweeping all the the the, the hash off the table into bags and trying to get, you know. 
and uh, trying to get everything out of the issue. You know, she says the police are on their way. And yeah, it was it was a mess. Um, you finally got back to the apartment, you know. I already had all my suitcases and packed. everything packed and yeah, ready yeah. to go. She was screaming, get out. You're not even supposed to be here. You're not Jason Pinsky. So, uh, so yeah, when you guys finally got back from uh, the pancake house, um, then she screamed at you for a long time yeah, too, right? Yeah, I had to talk to her husband. And, like, uh, you know, interestingly enough, I convinced them to let us stay. And we did, we did not get Somehow you dab. ended up getting them to do dabs. That, that was the amazing part. Like, I did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy came back. The guy said, okay, you can stay one more night. You said, you can't kick us out. It's, it's, it's two in the morning now. Where are we going to go? So, uh, so, yeah, so somehow the guy said, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. Yeah. And we'll settle. That's what I, that, I remember him coming back, but I don't remember getting him high. Um, you gave him a dab. You educated him, and then you gave him a dab. See? And told him that we were actually taking part in, like, something, like, medical instead of, you know, selling drugs. Did I give him the whole spiel on, uh, on, on cannabis? Yeah, we're, our job, we're here, yeah, and we're here to sample all these things so that we can find the best things, you know? This is all in the I pursuit have, of knowledge. I have limited. You somehow memory. convinced him that a high times contest was, like, Legit. you know, like saving lives. And, uh, and you got him to try dabs. And then they ended up letting us stay for the rest of the time there, which is amazing. Amazing. That is an amazing story. My, my first cannabis cup was in 94. Um, so I hadn't actually been back to Amsterdam in 20 years. 2014 was was 20 years later. And it was the last time High Times did a, a, a cannabis cup. But um, but yeah, I, I had judged, um, we had judged a, a, a lot of cups together, right? Denver, 420, yeah, we did. We did the circuit for a while until they, until they uh, changed the rules, basically on account of us. I think it was the unofficial Pinsky rule. Is that what uh, you couldn't judge more than one cup? Two, two yeah, cups. You could do in, two a year. You could do two a year. It used to be you could do them all if you knew uh, the right guy. I was like the uh, the Simon Cowell of concentrates. We were like you were the asshole Joe, and I was like the asshole Judge from New York. That'd always be like, eh, mm, eh. Yeah. Yeah. And Brandon was winning them all. So we were like the magic combination. Yeah. That was definitely a good time. It's not quite like that. What, uh, these days, you know, I mean, back, uh, in the day there was a lot of BHO, um, and really good artistry. Right. I think recently BHO, uh, and rosin are kind of like a hot topic of debate. I remember when, when, when rosin first started, all the BHO people were the snobs, right? He said, rosin is fucking garbage. Right. Anyone who smokes that shit is disgusting. Yeah. But at some point, the tables kind of turned, and now you got these rosin snobs. BHO is trash. And then also, I think that the, um, the hash makers themselves, right? Because uh, making rosin is still more of a craft, you know, kind of process. But I think there's also something to it. I think that... I think that after you smoke BHO for a few years, you go back to flour. At some point, there's like, there's a point where you, you're not getting the full effect anymore, and you realize that the only way to continuously get that is to go back to flour. Why? Because but the rosin boys like haven't gotten there yet because you know, give them five years of smoking that shit, and they'll be back on flour if the, you know, because I just feel like after years of doing dabs, like something was missing. And then returning to flour was what was missing. I mean, I wasn't getting high anymore from dabs. And to this day, I can never get as high from dabs as I get from flour. Yeah. You know, in the beginning, I got much more high from dabs. I mean, remember, you know, the 2011 or 12 when you started like seriously dabbing, this was getting very hot. This was what tipped me off to you. Actually, was I was seeing DJ Gravy and uh, getting some head stash from him, and I knew he had sour. And then he pulled out this little like glass jar. It probably was the consistency of what we would call like a, like a, a butter or something, you know. And uh, but man, when I opened the jar, the the smell coming off of it, I mean, it was super concentrated. And I hadn't even seen anything like that texture wise, like hash to me had been, you know, like Amsterdam style and it, you know, it was, uh, you know, or bubble hash, right, which, you know, still wasn't but it wasn't like a solvent extract. And, um, 
literally it probably was like the size of a big marble and you know back then i didn't even know exactly how to smoke it like there weren't dab rigs or anything like that so i remember like you know maybe putting it on a, a in a bowl or or you know putting it on some some weed or something but my biggest fear um was uh what was going to happen when this shit ran out you know and i asked gravy i'm like yo where did you where did you get that like what what the fuck is this and where did you get it? And he told me, you know, I got it from AJ, you know, <laughs> and that was the catalyst of me all of a sudden being like, oh man, you know, I don't know what happened with AJ, but like, can you let him know I didn't rob him? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know, it was this whole, it was probably when I uh, first saw that concentrate and then knew it came from you where I like, you know, got into my brain that like, you know, where did it go wrong? And I knew that you uh, had a falling out with Brandon. I was like, fuck, this guy is never going to, this guy is never going to forgive me. Like my chances with, with, with AJ are, are, are over, you know? So it was like, uh, you know, it was like a calculated effort. Like there were like, you know, through gravy, I was like, you know, trying to like have him put in the good word. When I got out to Colorado with, with, with Adam, you know, there were, did you, did you hear through the grapevine that I was trying to get in touch before we met or? Yeah. I said, who that guy? <laughs> Fuck him. Fuck that guy. <laughs> it wasn't until I bumped into you at high times. Yeah. And then, uh, you said, so, uh, you said, you know, what can we do to make this right? When I bumped into you at high times, I think it was in either 2013 or 2014, right? I gave you a test. I said, Neil Diamond's playing a concert in two weeks at Erasmus High School where he graduated from, right? I remember there this. There was 100, 180 seats. I remember I said, this you one. get me into that show, and uh, I'm going to give you a second chance. <laughs> well... <laughs> It was it was kind of like our first date. And I thought there was no way you could pull it off, actually. I was actually trying to give you something impossible to do. I think I knew the guy that did the security. Um, you know, at that time, I had been recording shows in the city. So, like, a lot of the, the music scene and the people that worked within it were, like, you know, friends of ours. You know? I still have the, uh, the, 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 the laminate. and Me too. The, the, yeah. the poster. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Whoever thought that Neil Diamond would uh, would rekindle uh, our relationship? It was an impossible challenge. You weren't even supposed to be able to do it. It's just a, I, I, I was like, well, I did say that, so I guess I got, now I got to give this guy a second chance. Maybe one day I'll put a test like that in front of Brandon, and he can uh, try and uh, meet the challenge. I have a, uh, I have a, a, a. That's how these high prices also started. Is that. If there were people that were getting on my nerves, I would charge them $9,200 for a pound of weed. And I was mostly hoping that they would just go away and not come back. But the problem is, is that they would, always, you know, whatever I, however, however much I asked for, they would always agree to. So yeah. I, I mean, I couldn't come up with a number that was too high that would drive certain people off. So I couldn't get certain people out of my life, you know, just because every time I put a test before them, they'd pass it. So, you know, if they were willing to, and you know, I'm thinking, well, okay, if you're willing to pay that much, then I guess I'm gonna keep you around. I used Sour Diesel as like my business card. Like, you know, like it was never really like, um, you know, I mean, like if you had my number, but really it was like, here's my card and it's like, smell this, you know? What was your experience of like, uh, you know, did it, did you find that the weed got you access to different things and, and, and of what sort? Yeah. I mean, it pretty much opened every door and, um, yeah, everywhere you went really, it was hard to keep it under wraps because, you know, the smell was just emanating off of me. Even yeah. if I, even if I didn't bring sour diesel with me somewhere just that having that essence surrounding me kind of like helped in all sorts of circumstances. You know, you'd go to a restaurant and the maitre d' now is your best friend. Or yeah. you, go, you go to, uh, uh, you know, you go to the comic book store to buy action figures and now that guy's your best friend. You go to Patagonia to buy a new shirt, that guy's uh, your new best friend. So yeah, everywhere I went, I kind of like 
had a you know a trail of like people looking to get involved in my life yeah. somehow you yeah. know looking to be best friends i think peter luger's was probably the the best expression of that see yeah yeah and you know i always kept those guys kind of guessing though they never knew what i was up to that was my 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 dinner table yeah but, but i never really like I never, you know, you, you and Rick and everybody giving those guys weed. I never did that at all. You know, I just gave those guys money. I never gave them. First time I ever gave him weed was a couple months ago when we were in New York. Oh, really? Yeah. That was like the first time I've ever given anyone at Peter Luger's weed. I used to live uh, on the block. So, uh, I used to get those Tootsie Rolls from Rick and we would, we would hand those out and, uh, that was like, you know, well known. I think I'm, you know, more well known for Peter Luger's, but really like your legendary status is, is unfettered. I've probably eaten at Luger's more times than, you know, anybody. I mean, maybe there's like 10 other people in the world that have eaten at Luger's as many times as me, you know? I ate there every <laughs> single day for, you know, years, <laughs> years. It's the only place to eat, you know? The, you wake up in Brooklyn and Williamsburg, there's nowhere else to eat, you know? Now you have choices if you're in Williamsburg, but back then there, there was no choice, you know? Ultimately, I did it all for the weed, you know? I, I could have I could've changed careers many times, I could have done, you know, I could have sold drugs. I could have done things that were more profitable, but it was always for the love of weed that, you know, that I did all this and first and foremost. And I think that also is the reason why, you know, I always had good weed at a time when most people did not. And it's because it wasn't, a, it, the making money was always secondary. It was always about having the best weed. Yeah. You know? That opened doors for other opportunities and other uh, situations, and it made money. But first and foremost, it was always just to have good weed. It still is, you know. I mean, that, if that's your priority, then you know you, there's going to be a qualitative difference between your product and someone else's. Yeah. And it was never about how much you, could you grow. It was never about. You know, it was literally about having the best. How weed. could we have the best weed? And yeah. That's it. And just let's just focus on that. I was always the brokest one out of all, out of everybody, but I had the weed, so I was in the club, and 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 I was, fr I didn't have to work at nine a.m. You know, so I was I was free to go out every night of the week and and get into things and 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 go to weird places and events, and and that sort of also put me in the same arena with. Lots of rich kids and, and drug dealers. Rich kids and uh, drug dealers sounds like a fish tour to me in the 90s. Yeah. Know, well, so. then there was that whole scene, but there was also just like a, a kind of like a an underworldy type scene that wasn't so wasn't so hippie and wasn't, you know, it was just the city had its own characters and, and types of, 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 of people that were more like on the street where yeah tip than yeah. uh and the street culture tip than the than the parking lot culture yeah yeah totally. you know i always kind of had a foot in both worlds um i understood the whole parking lot culture stuff you know like i i understood all that but i also uh understood the, the like the street culture well you were a fixture right in in new york both of us had you know relationships with uh, uh different people in the art world or different you know people in the the music world. What are some of the things that you remember, or what are some of the things that you miss, rather, you know, from from New York? Like when I go back to New York these days, man, I can barely remember like anything. You know, like it takes me, like I have to be in town for like a day, and then all of a sudden, like you know, everything will just kind of click back. Um, what are some of the things that you miss most about uh, New York? I miss. Being able to eat in the middle of the night, I miss uh, being able to, there's a certain freedom in living in New York where, you know, there's just a lot of possibilities. Yeah. Moment to moment, you know, options, you know, you, your options narrow when you leave a place like that. And, and now you have, to, you know, I, my options are, you know, watch TV, go work in the grow, read a book. Yeah. Or go to bed early. You know, yeah. like the, the, in New York, it just seems like the options were infinite. You know, there's the, 
the work that both of us put in in New York is like, you know, finally being, you know, realized. Who are some of the other like cast of characters, you know, from back in the day? Like, uh, why isn't Mark Crystal uh, sitting here right now? Right? It would, like, it Mark wouldn't Crystal, he be the brain? You really should interview Mark Crystal. I mean, Mark Crystal is pretty much the way many uh, young teenage weed dealers got started. I mean, I would say that, like, you know, uh, Mark, Crystal, uh, both of us, like we, so we we were, you know, kept apart for quite some time and then we became friends and it wasn't probably until a couple of years into our friendship that we both realized that we had both gotten weed uh, from Mark Crystal back in the day. I met the Mark Crystal at Wetlands outside because he wasn't allowed inside. Um, yeah. They, they'd kicked him out. Um, but he could still stand on the corner in front of wetlands and sell weed. And so that's where I met him when I was about 17. And, uh, and yeah, changed the game, you know, and Mark Crystal, you know, he could sell you a a quarter pound, a pound, you know, Mark Crystal had every drug known to man. Yeah. And he just did. He was like the drug dealer that like we had dreamed of finding our entire adolescent lives that we finally found. He was like, Mark Crystal was the promised land to a 17 year old. I got uh, stuck in the elevator. He lived at the Chelsea Hotel. Of course, yeah, uh, room 325. 325 at the Chelsea Hotel. And I got stuck in the elevator one time and they had to call the fire department and and hoist us out of of the hole in the top of the elevator. You know, I, I saw him about 10 years ago and he hadn't changed at all. So what's just, uh, what's just happening in the garden? After 30 years, I need to, I need to make this something that I want to do or else I just can't. So for me, not, not doing it as often and doing it the way I want to do it and, and, you know, tr- growing, you know, trying out new varieties and, and, and breeding and 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 get you know these are the things that gets me that get me excited to walk into a, into a grow you know if i if i'm like dreading going to the grow then i'm i'm burned out or i'm doing something wrong so i try to keep it interesting so it's like something i still have passion for so what is it it's, it's hard to have passion for something after you know so much repetition for me it's it's growing new varieties seeing new things you know it's also growing vegetables is the same way i mean i get so excited for vegetables because they look so different than weed you know it's exciting to see a pepper grow it's exciting to grow a squash yeah when you've been growing the same plant for year after year after year um decade after decade so for me it's just about doing it at the right frequency so that i enjoy it and so that i can't wait to go in there every day and see uh you know progress and and can't wait to see how things are going to turn out. I know I'm not alone. There have been a lot of people that have been hitting me up and being like, yo, man, where is that? Where is that AJ Sauer? Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, yeah, I took a hiatus from Instagram and I recently went back and, you know, people are freaking out. Floodgates open, you know, I mean, people are freaking out. So maybe it's going to go from from Angel or Admiral back to to asshole Joe when people realize they're going to have a hard I'm time. I'm always going to be asshole to somebody. Yeah, I'll tell you that you, you'll never please everyone. Well, it, it's, so it's uh, going to be someone out there. Some things aren't really going to change. You know, it's 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 going to be now again figuring out like you know who gets what, right? Yeah, I, I think that's the way that it always should be when it comes to you know to 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 your shit. You know that uh, that it's a limited supply, and it's it's not about you know what it costs or whatnot, but it's about like you know the opportunity, right, to to participate. Yeah, and I get I get attacked. You know, I've always whenever I've put a lot of energy and effort into a, a grow, I get very attached to it. You know, if I had my way, I wouldn't sell any any of it. Yeah, I always felt the same way. It, it, whenever <laughs> I bought Headstash, I would buy it for myself and then having to get rid you of any of it. You justify buying it by saying, oh, I could sell this for top dollar. Yeah, then yeah, yeah. Can't part with it, really. Well, we're looking forward to, uh, to, to this uh, fresh harvest and uh, appreciate you sitting down. This has been good chopping it up and getting uh, some of the stories out. I'm, I'm sure that uh, the people want to know 
uh, the origin stories of how things got out and how things were in the 90s. You know, the market is so different now. So, you know, sharing this uh, knowledge, I think, is really important uh, for uh, for the community at large just to really understand, you know, what 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 the roots are and really the people that, um, you know, that carried this before there was an industry and who really carved the path for the, the movement that we have today. To even scratch the surface, you know, it would take it would take us 12 hours. So, you know, when you're ready to take me to a nice beach in the Caribbean and uh, uh, do this right. Yeah, we'll, we'll sit, sit down. there and, yeah. uh, you know, we can we can go from start to finish. Well, um, more to come then for part two yeah. of the uh, Pinsky and the Brain interview. Uh, we've been with Joe Murray, a.k.a. A.J. Sour Diesel, as we've been exploring the nature of what's some known as the best weed in the world. Um, Joe, thanks for sitting down with us. It's Pinsky in the Brain, and we're out.